Hello and welcome everyone to our webinar that's offered jointly by the Mobilize Center and Restore Center at Stanford University. I'm Matt Petrucci, I'm the Scientific Program Manager of both these centers and I'm excited to be your moderator today. Today's speaker is Keenan Whirling, who will be presenting Add Biomechanics, a free online tool with the mission of enhancing the impact of biomechanical motion capture efforts by helping labs process and share their data. The first part of the webinar will describe how the tool works and outline the data sharing vision of the platform. And in the second part, he will walk participants through a tutorial of uploading and processing motion capture data and provide best practices and troubleshooting tips. Today's webinar is brought to you by the Mobilize and Restore Centers, which are both supported by the National Institutes of Health. The Mobilize Center is, focusing, is focused on developing and disseminating state-of-the-art biomechanics and machine learning tools for researchers to analyze human movement. The Restore Center is working to make these and other tools for real-world assessment of movement more widely available to the rehab research community. Now, before we get started, a couple quick reminders about the format of the webinar. We'll have a research talk, and then we'll have a tutorial, and we'd love to take your questions from both. We'll take your questions at the end of the research talk and at the end of the tutorial. So please type your questions into the Q&A panel in Zoom, so not the chat and the Q&A panel, and we'll review them from there. Uh, one other thing to note, this webinar will be recorded and posted to our YouTube channel. Now I'd like to uh, introduce our speaker for today. It's uh, Keenan Whirling is a third year PhD student in computer science and bi biomechanics at Stanford University. Keenan did his undergrad at Stanford in computer science and published two first author papers in Chris Manning's NLP group. After undergrad, he founded Eloquent Labs, which built AI chatbots for customer service and it grew to 10 people and was acquired by Square in 2019. Now back at Stanford, Keenan has been working on curing movement disabilities and better powered exoskeletons. His work is supported by an NSF GRFP award and an NIH R01. That work started with Nimble Physics, which is a differentiable physics engine for simulating human and humans and machines. This formed the foundational technology that enables ad biomechanics. So Kina is now working on using machine learning and custom uh, wearable sensors to make better exoskeleton controllers uh, with the data that the community has shared on ad biomechanics. So with that, we're excited to have you all here today. I know we're all excited to hear uh, Keenan speak about this amazing tool, so I'll let him go ahead and begin. Okay, thanks, Matt. Right. Let me share my screen here and uh, get started. All right, All right. That's good. Our, our webinar today is uh, Add Biomechanics, Lowering the Barriers to Musculoskeletal Modeling and Large-Scale Discoveries in Biomechanics. Um, I'm Keenan Worley. You can follow me on Twitter. I refuse to call it X at my name. Um, okay, so part one, I'm calling this the orientation section. And we're gonna ask these four questions. What is ad biomechanics? Does it actually work? How does it work? And why does the tool make all the data public? So starting at the beginning, what is ad biomechanics? Because you're at this webinar, you're probably familiar with the optical motion capture workflow. Um, you recruit subjects, consent them in, cover them in optical markers, record some data of them moving around. And then if you do um, musculoskeletal modeling, you probably manually find a scaled model of your subject and then use that along with tools like OpenSim to analyze your results, compute the quantities of interest for your scientific study um, and move on. And this is really a problem because uh, the, the manual scaling here can take days per subject. Um, and that's actually a huge drain on the resources of your lab. Um, so for those of you who have seen uh, HBO's Chernobyl series, here's a meme about it. Uh, what is the cost of model scaling? And I would say the cost of all of that manual processing is a few things. And you can choose how you want to pay this cost, but you have to pick at least one. Either you have less data in your study, so you have less subjects or less processing, or you have less time to do other high value research activities like writing grants and training students and coming up with creative new ideas. Um, or you just don't process your data and then you lose access to all of these important insights you gain from accurate musculoskeletal models of your subjects. 
And ultimately, whatever you choose, less science gets done. So what if you automated this step in your workflow? That's where ad biomechanics comes in. We take your uh, output of your motion capture system, are able to automatically produce scaled, accurate, uh, even physically dynamically accurate models of your subjects, and then you can use your results right away. So that sounds great, but does it actually work? Now, in order to know if it works, uh, we're going to use two different metrics. So we're going to compare marker reconstruction error of our models and forces reconstruction error. And I'm going to talk about what each of those metrics are. This may be familiar for many of you, but for those of you for whom it's not, here we go. Um, your optical motion capture system will produce clouds of labeled points that are your measured markers in 3D space. Um, we're then going to reconstruct a virtual subject with virtual markers on them and try to scale and pose that subject in such a way that it matches your actual recorded optical marker locations as closely as possible. Um, any discrepancies between what we get in our simulated model and what you actually recorded in the lab are errors. So we take the RMS over those and we use that as a measure of how well did we scale and pose and set marker offsets on your model um, to match your data. The second metric we're gonna use is for evaluating the quality of the physics that we get. So this will be a familiar equation for those of you who have worked with articulated rigid body dynamics. Um, this is basically the, the generalized version of F equals MA from high school physics class. Um, we can infer given the motion from the motion capture and all of the forces recorded on the force plates, what the joint torques must have been in order to achieve the motion that we saw. Um, and if in these joint torques, we have any joint torques acting between the world and the subject's root node, whether that's your pelvis or the base of your spine, however you define your skeleton, um, those are errors. Said another way, there's no gigantic robot arm um, attached to all of your subjects that's able to produce forces and torques on them uh, separate from their feet's contact with the ground. So any, any of those, we call them residual forces, are going to be counted as an error. Okay, so we have these two metrics, marker reconstruction error and forces reconstruction error. And we're going to compare how well ad biomechanics is able to optimize those errors against human experts manually scaling models. So we'll start, I'll pick on Scott Ulrich because he's in the lab and he's a super genius. He is one of the best people in the world at manually scaling models. And he was generous enough to offer us some of the data that he scaled for us to compare against. Um, so we took some data where he had scaled it just to optimize marker error. He wasn't worried about physics. He was just trying to get the subject scales and marker offsets to match as closely as possible what was recorded optically. And the marker errors he got are shown in gray over here. And Ad Biomechanics got these marker errors in blue um, in half an hour with no human effort, which um, I would say is within noise. We're approximately as good as Scott at this, which I feel really good about. Um, just for fun, we also checked the forces error. And I should preface this by saying, Scott was not working on trying to minimize the forces error. This data was not going to be used for any sort of dynamic analysis, so that was not important. Um, but when you run that analysis, if you're not paying attention to the forces error, um, these dashed lines here are the um, are the Hicks thresholds for acceptable errors, basically. And um, it turns out that if you don't pay attention, your forces errors are really quite bad. Like you, those require some some manual tweaking. But Ad Biomechanics gets these for free because it's part of how it is optimizing your data. Um, as a side note, if you haven't checked, um, that's almost certainly what your forces look like too. Okay, moving on. So if you um, if you do spend a lot of time trying to optimize your uh, residual forces so that your dynamics in your simulation are very consistent with um, what you measured in your force plates, uh, a good example of that is this Hamner data set from 2013. Um, what often happens is that you end up paying a penalty in terms of having higher marker error. So you can kind of trade off between physics and marker consistency. Um, and you'll see that on this comparison, ad biomechanics keeps 
a pretty good marker error, um, just like it had in the previous data set, while also maintaining uh, comparably low forces and uh, torque errors to the human expert. OK, so hopefully you're somewhat convinced that it actually works. Um, so how does it do this? Um, and I'll say there's no magic. There's no machine learning model in here guessing that occasionally gets things very wrong. It's just a carefully selected sequence of non-convex optimization steps. And I'll walk you through them one at a time, um, in part just to explain how the tool works and in part to give you some intuition as a user of the tool for um, what kinds of data lead to what kinds of outcomes. Before I go into detail, I'm gonna say I'm not gonna show a lot of equations. If you're interested in equations and implementation details, I'm gonna refer you to the, um, the paper, which is currently up on BioArchive, uh, easy to find with Add Biomechanics BioArchive. I think we're also dropping a link in the chat. Okay, so returning to our sequence of optimization steps. We start by finding functional joint centers. And this step is based on your marker motion across all of the trials for your subject. Um, we use several least squares methods. The first one is this Chang-Pollard method. Um, and then we do a, a non-convex refinement of the joint centers. Important to note, and I'll return to this, this step gets no information from a static trial. So static trials are not actually as useful for us as they are for other tools. So once you have the joint center information, um, we can use those as additional markers and now run a inverse kinematics and scaling step on a bunch of separate frames of your data all in parallel. Um, and these tend to converge very well. And then you can average the results of those as an initial scaling guess to then throw into this big bi-level optimization problem where we give the computer um, the double objective that it wants to pick all of the scales for all of the bones in your body and all of the marker offsets on those bones such that if you run inverse kinematics, um, you get the lowest possible marker RMS. So there's a nested objective term in there. Um, and this tends to produce pretty good results fairly quickly. Um, and if you don't have any force information, you can stop here and just get your kinematics data and move on with your life. And this makes your processing faster. Um, but if you do have force plates, then we can take a couple more steps to make your data um, physically consistent with the force plates also. Um, so the first step to do that, which I think is kind of the secret sauce of ad biomechanics actually, is that if you know the mass of your subject and you know all the external forces acting on that mass, um, you actually know the acceleration of the center of mass. So you can think of a force plate as a very expensive, very accurate center of mass accelerometer. Um, and if you know the accelerations of an object over time, it's actually easy to set up a linear system of equations to solve for the initial conditions in terms of position and velocity of that object, such that its trajectory matches as closely as possible to whatever we got from the kinematics. Um, so we can run this problem and it will produce a trajectory that looks actually shockingly close to whatever we got out of the bi-level optimization, um, but tweaked in such a way that our residuals are near zero which is awesome because that then gives us a much better starting point for this great big, very non-convex, very initialization sensitive problem where we tell the optimizer, okay, now you're pretty close to the right thing, go nuts. You can change any of the link masses, any of the inertial properties, any of the marker offsets, you can tweak all the joint angles, just get us as close as possible to a perfect match with the markers and with the force plates. Um, and I'll say this whole pipeline can run in about 30 minutes for one of your subjects because it's been fairly carefully optimized. Um, and we host this on our supercomputer for free. So if you're, if you're processing large data sets, we can spin up huge numbers of computers um, in a fairly short amount of time to process all of your subjects in parallel. Um, and we do this to drive movement science breakthroughs, which we hope will, will come out of having more access to more data. Um, so, Last question, why does the tool make all the data public? And my first slide here is, wait, Add Biomechanics makes all the data public? Yes. Um, we host this as an online tool. You need to confirm that you get informed subject consent to share anonymized motion data before you upload. This is super important. We are not HIPAA compliant. We do not want to mess with 
GDPR, any, the data you share has to be public from the beginning. Um, all the data is accessible to anyone with the link. Um, so this is hopefully very convenient for working within your lab um, and also potentially advertising your work if you want to tweet links to, to visualizations, which you'll see later in the talk. Um, you can totally do that. Also, because the data is public, we periodically aggregate all of the uploaded data that passes some quality checks into big, clean data set releases. And our first big release is coming towards the end of this calendar year, and we're working hard on it. So why do we do that? Why do we make all the uploaded data public? Really, at the end of the day, it's because we want a huge, high-quality, public biomechanics data set to exist. Um, and you can think of this as kind of like donating to musicians when you donate your, your data to us. Building and maintaining this tool has been a huge amount of work. Um, and we literally put on the grants that we are going to uh, build this tool in order to create a large public data set. And so by donating your data to that large public data set, you are in some literal sense helping fund the development of the tool. Um, so, okay, that all sounds great, Keenan. A big public data set would be great, but the idea of sharing my data as I process it, as I'm doing my science, makes me feel uneasy. I have gotten a million variations of this, and I want to address them one at a time, because I think most of these have really good answers. Um, so let's start with, I don't have subject consent to share my data, or I don't have IRB approval to share my data. I've never done this before. I typically just collect my data and then publish my paper. How do I do this? Um, stay tuned. We have an easy starter kit for copy-pastable text you can use for consent forms, and for IRB amendments, um, hopefully we can make this process really easy for you, uh, at least for new data sets that you collect in the future or are planning to collect or are collecting right now. Um, so the next question is, I'm messing around with pilot data. I collected this sloppily. I'm just kind of playing around for an afternoon with a new idea for a study. Um, this data probably isn't high enough quality to go into a public data set. And to that, I say, thank you for being so considerate. Um, we actually have a way to mark this in the UI as you're going, um, so you can flag the data to us that it requires extra scrutiny before being included in a public release and probably shouldn't be included, and um, we really appreciate those flags, but don't let this stop you from using the tool to process your data because it will save you a ton of time in getting to those first pilot results and iterating on your um, research process. Okay, next objection, which is completely reasonable. I'm worried about getting scooped on work in progress science. And to this I say, uh, you only need to share the motion data to use ad biomechanics. So if you're studying how uh, hamstring strength training affects self-selected running speed, um, all of the data about how much hamstring strength training each subject got and what each subject's trial represents is still in your spreadsheet and is not public. The only thing that's public is we just need the motion capture from the people running. So all that will be public is a bunch of running data. Um, no one can use that to scoop your work. Uh, that will just be helpful to other folks working on large and running machine learning projects. Okay, I want credit for the data I collected. I want you to get credit too. I think it's really important that people get credit for the data they, they upload. Otherwise, um, there's no incentive for these data sets to continue to grow. Um, so using the public data set releases that we uh, put out will require citing the authors of the original data. And we have two mechanisms that we're thinking about to do this. Um, while the number of authors who actually make their, uh, make the quality bar into the public data set remains manageable, we're just going to require people who use the data set releases to cite everyone individually in their papers. Um, if the number ever grows so large that we are getting complaints from conferences and journals that we really can't have bibliographies this long for people using this data set, um, then we will probably release individual papers for the data set releases that have as authors everyone who contributed to the data set. Um, we'll work on this, but we will make sure you get credit that helps your academic career moving forward, because um, I think that's really, really important. Okay, so that gets to the last thing. I can't share for other reasons. 
uh, I have a commercial constraint, I have a partnership and working with a pro sports team, whatever it is. And really this boils down to someone owns this data and doesn't want to share. And to that I say, we totally get it. Contracts and partners sometimes mean you can't share the data you collect. There are other tools you can use. Um, OpenSim, which is a great public tool, um, is licensed under a commercial friendly license. You can go ahead and keep using that and manually scaling your data um, while you work on convincing your partners to let you use ad biomechanics, which I strongly encourage you to uh, try to convince them because it will be great. Okay, so now that we feel a little bit better about sharing, let's talk about the dream here. And uh, let me motivate this with a quick personal story. And I'll make this quick to leave some time for questions. Um, I personally need a big biomechanics data set to exist. And I've spent a lot of my time building ad biomechanics. And here's why. Um, here's a belated intro. I'm Keenan. I'm a third year PhD student. I will be officially a fourth year in a few days when the quarter starts. I have an incurable neuropathy. I have one letter wrong in my MFN2 gene. Um, which causes a, a condition called CMT type 2A, um, which causes my peripheral motor neurons to slowly die. And they've been dying since I was about eight. Um, and at this point, as a newly 30-year-old man, I have a lot of upper leg atrophy um, to the point where I can, I have trouble uh, lifting my, my tibia under its own weight, but I can do it. Um, and I'm completely paralyzed from the knee down. So I wear rigid uh, ankle braces to help me walk. I also have a little bit of hand weakness, but that's not as relevant. And as the disease progresses, I'm trying to avoid ever needing to use a wheelchair. Nothing against wheelchairs. Wheelchairs are wonderful. I use them right now uh, to get around museums and things, but I, I don't want to have to use them in order to walk. Um, and there's only a few years left before the alternatives like powered exoskeletons really need to work. Because I'm at Stanford, I've had the wonderful privilege to get to try and be involved in a whole bunch of different exoskeletons ranging from really expensive commercial stuff to really expensive academic stuff to completely jank prototypes made of brooms and duct tape to military devices to other commercial devices, other academic devices. Um, and my experiences have been uniformly underwhelming. And this is no shade on the people who are working really, really hard on the mechanical engineering. The devices are all beautiful and work really well. Um, the problem is that the device doesn't know what I want it to do. And so it's a little bit like being a three-legged race with a giant robot where we're negotiating together about how it's going to use its enormous strength to help me move um, when really sometimes it feels like it just wants me to give in to how it wants us to move together. Um, and the problem here is that standard robot control breaks when you add humans. Like the things that we know how to do for manufacturing and moving around and open loop control they all don't work as soon as there's like a fleshy, inconvenient thing with its own nervous system and its own goals attached to your, to your actuators. Um, now you, you have this crazy coordination game. And to solve that, we need better models of the human. We need more accurate real-time sensing for things like ground forces and joint torques. We need better models of the nervous system, better models of the energetics of gait. Um, and, and I mean, this is unfair because this work is way out of date, but this caricature isn't going to cut it as as the type of thing that at least the computer science community where I come from uh, has been working on to try to solve these sorts of problems. So what's missing from the existing models? And the answer in short is data. Like there's actually a lot of public motion data. Um, almost all of it lacks real physical measurements. So there's very little public motion data with ground reaction forces um, and inferring them from things like reinforcement learning and brick feet uh, is, is often totally wrong. So who else could we help with more data? Um, machine learning is a powerful hammer. Uh, I think that's hard to, to dispute. And given enough data, I think it could be applied to a lot of things. And, and here's just a short brainstorming list of, of tasks. But I would say uh, the important thing is your task here. Like once this data set is easy to download and use, um, I hope that all of you on, on this webinar find interesting uh, uses and ways to help people with their lives. Okay, so that is the end of part one. I think we have five minutes for questions here. How do we want to do this, Matt? Are you? Um, no, that's great. Yeah. Out? No, it sounds good. We can answer a few questions here. Thanks for super clear talk and motivating everything. Uh, now we'll go ahead and switch to the Q and A. Um, we'll try to start the tutorial right at 
ten thirty, and then uh, we can answer any questions after that as well. So, uh, what first question that came in was from Sam Hamner. Uh, how well does Ad Biomechanics handle gaps in marker data? So, for example, he has data where some markers drop for almost up to a second or during a twenty to thirty second trial. Do I still need to clean these gaps in your motion capture? You know, in his motion capture data. We built it from the beginning to be resilient to marker drops. Um, so there is nothing that will cause the pipeline to crash. Oh, thank you. Um, we, there's, there's nothing that will cause the pipeline to crash if uh, you upload very gappy marker data. And if there is enough information in the remaining markers, the inverse kinematics and dynamic solvers should be able to infer the motion um, from smoothness constraints and seeing what's there. But I should caveat that by saying it's not magic. So if you're doing something where you miss the entire end of a limb, if you don't have the, the wrist markers and you want it to figure out what the elbow joint angle is and there's really no information, um, the best it'll do is probably a linear interpolation between the frames where it saw the, the elbow angle, um, which may or may not be good enough for you. So if you need, if you have very gappy data and you don't have the full uh, enough constraints, you may want to fill it in. Makes sense. Uh, another question from Sam was, are, are the joint center estimations sensitive to the range of motion uh, the joint moves through during the trial? For example, in the past, we have taken uh, special functional joint center movements to calculate joint centers. If a joint has little excursion, say like a stiff knee, that may impact the uh, knee joint center estimation. Yes. Uh, the, the, the details of this are a bit... Uh, gnarly, so I glossed over them in the talk, but the, the deal is if you have a basically a one-doff rotational joint like a knee, especially if you're doing a lot of sagittal plane motion, um, the traditional joint functional joint center finders can have a lot of ambiguity uh, with respect to that axis. Like any, any point along the axis of the knee rotation will actually have an equally good solution in terms of the loss functions for finding functional joint centers, because you're still rotating about that point and the distances to the markers are still fixed. Um, so we actually do account for that. We solve an extra problem to find that axis. And then when we're using the joint center information later on, we allow that joint to sit anywhere along the axis when we're solving IK and, and subsequent optimization problems, um, because that helps kind of address the, the problem. So the answer is yes. And actually that was an important, uh, piece of making it work. Yeah, for sure. A uh, question from Jonathan Glenday. Uh, can you define manual scale factors for geometries like the femur if you have a pre-op CT or is all or is it all measured uh, base scaling? So currently uh, it's all automated because we've actually never gotten this request before, but it's not hard to add constraints. If you have more information, um, I'm happy to work with you on making the, the tool uh, able to enter that. Yeah. Uh, maybe one more before we start. Uh, uh, Reginald uh, Fukuchi, uh, how well does Ad Biomechanics work with walking and double stance face uh, data, basically? Um, seems to work quite well. I mean, walking is, uh, walking is where we get some of our lowest residual errors for dynamics. Um, and the... Um, yeah, I mean, I, the, the the challenging motions actually tend to be things like drop jumps for solving physics, because when there's a lot of very high frequency content impulse that is actually really important in order to make the motion work, um, if you do any smoothing beforehand, often the, the resulting torques on the center of mass at the impact can be way off. Um, and that can cause it to have trouble converging. So the, um, but, but walking, since everything is pretty smooth, uh, works quite well. 